Good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to have you with us uh, today. Um, thank you for joining our policy briefing, which is a returning of Yosegaki Hinomaru to where they belong. Today's event features Mr. Rex Zeke, co-founder and president of Obon Society, with commentary from Honorable Haruko Arimura, member of the House of Counselors of Japan. We also have a special guest, Mr. Hidemi Mutsuda, a member of the Mutsuda family. Uh, my name is Shanti Shoji, Director of Programs at Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA. We are a 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to deepening the understanding of and strengthening ties between the US and Japan for a free and open international community. Our programs mainly focus on security and diplomacy, and we uh, do a range of activities through publications, networking, discussions, dialogues, and policy briefings like this morning. Today's event is being recorded and is on the record. A recap and video recording will be made and available on Sasakawa USA's website in the coming weeks. There will also be time for a Q&A uh, during the program later on, and you can submit your questions via the Q&A uh, chat function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, questions can be submitted at any time, so uh, if they pop up as you're listening, uh, please feel free to submit those. And uh, we really look forward to our discussion today with you all. And with that, I'd like to pass it to Dr. Satohiro Akimoto, Chairman and President of Sasakawa Peace Foundation USA. Thank you, Shanti. I am Satohiro Akimoto. Thank you very much for joining us today. I'm honored to hold today's event about the Yosegaki Hinomaru, particularly the one belonged to late Mr. Shigeyoshi Mutsuda and the Mutsuda family. It's a powerful story of Yosegaki Hinomaru returning to the Mutsuda family almost 80 years after the flood left the family house in Gifu. It was made possible by the family's deep love and the connection with Mr. Shigeyoshi Mutsuda, a member of the family who was killed in Saipan during the World War II, with thoughtful support by Mr. and Mrs. Rex Zeke, founder of Obon Society, an associate of the society such as Bethany Glenn, and also thoughtful gesture and kindness by all the people involved in this remarkable journey of the flag back to the Mutsuda family in Japan at the USS Lexington Museum of Corpus Christi, Texas, led by Mr. Steve Banta, executive director of the museum. Mr. Rex Zeke founded Auburn Society with his wife Keiko for the purpose of demonstrating peace, friendship, and reconciliation between families and nations by returning Yosegaki Hinomaru to Japan. The remarks which Rex will deliver today is a powerful story of family love, service to the nation, honoring war death, friendship, reconciliation between the United States and Japan. It is also a story of what we can learn from our past and move forward for a better world with a purpose. Obon Society has been doing special work in my view. A special work needs special people with a strong sense of caring, duty, and honor. Rex is certainly one such person. Honorable Haruko Arimura, an upper house member of Japan, is a strong supporter of Obon Society. She takes national security seriously and takes this issue of some 50,000 Yosegaki Hinomaru in the United States seriously. She has raised this issue in a national diet session and worked with online auctioneers on Yosegaki Hinomaru in the marketplaces. I am grateful that she joined us today, despite her tremendously busy schedule. Lastly, I, like, I am truly honored to have a member of the Mutsuda family, Professor Hidemi Mutsuda of Hiroshima University, a grandson of Mr. Shigeyoshi Mutsuda, joining us today. He would like to say a word of appreciation representing the Mutsuda family. Professor Mutsuda is on a business trip and is joining us from London, England. So thank you very much. With that, Rex, floor is yours. I, I am delighted and honored to participate in this Sasakawa Peace Foundation 
policy briefing series. Uh, uh, I can think of no better place to introduce and explain the working of Obon Society. So I'd like to thank you, Dr. Akimoto, for this invitation to, to present a new idea and, uh, and to that whose purpose is to improve and strengthen the relationship between America and Japan, and also to make this a better world. And I'd also like to thank Ms. Arimura, who I know is contacting us from Tokyo. At this hour, most people are either in bed or getting ready for bed, and she is up and alert and ready to contribute to this uh, conference. So thank you very much, Ms. Arimura, for giving us your time and attention. Um, before I begin, I have a couple comments here because I've been reading uh, quite a bit about American foreign policy, and I've been reading the writings of one particular man, Mr. Richard Haas, who is a very well-known and influential diplomat and, and foreign policy expert, advisor to presidents, and he wrote one comment that really struck with me, it stuck with me, and he said how he kind of regretted and lamented the fact that most people working in government today are unable to have the time to ponder history, that their, their lives are just too busy dealing with the matters of today and tomorrow and next week, that they don't have the luxury of thinking back at what was going on 20 years ago or 200 years ago and, and seeing the relevance of that. And I thought when I read that, I'm very fortunate to not be a government official because I like to look back at history. I spend a lot of time looking at history. History for me is a window that I can look through and look at my father's generation and my grandfather's generation and my great grandfather's generation and look at the decisions they made and measure how they impact our lives today. And not all of their decisions are perfect. In fact, that's one thing about history. When you study it, you always see things that you wish you could go back and change. You wish you could alter it, but you can't. However, I am witnessing here in the Pacific Northwest something happening where people are fixing bad ideas. And in particular, my grandfather's generation thought it was a good idea to put dams across rivers and retain that water in reservoirs for irrigation. And they did this, but all of the fish disappeared. The fish were unable to swim up and down the rivers. People today are looking at this situation and they are saying, let's fix this. That was a bad idea. And they are removing the dams and the salmon are coming back into these rivers. And so that's kind of a hopeful sign that just because somebody made a bad decision some years ago, it doesn't mean we can't fix that. Now, something else of history that happened recently that I paid particular attention to, and that was when the United States invited to America both Korea and Japan. And, uh, and uh, they, uh, I was particularly attended to um, to uh, the fact that I saw Mr. President Biden with Prime Minister Kishida. And I kept waiting for somebody in the news to point out the significance of this meeting, because here it is, August 2023. And I kept waiting for somebody to say it, but they didn't. None of the reporters did, because coincidentally, it was 170 years earlier from this meeting when the Commodore Perry expedition first entered Japan. That was in July of 1853. And from July 1853 to August of 2023 is 170 years. And this was right when the Americans first saw the Japanese. Prior to this time, no American had ever seen a Japanese person or sat and talked to them. And of course, no Japanese had ever seen an American. And you can tell that when you look at the portraits that the Japanese artists tried to use to convey what these Caucasian Americans look like, and they're struggling with that. But here we are, 2023, 
and that marked 170 years of association between America and Japan. And I looked at these two men standing there, and I just looked and thought, look at what these two nations, these two cultures that came together, look at what they brought the world. I look around me, I look around everywhere here in my house, and I see everywhere Japanese technology and engineering, whether it is my Sony headphones or my Panasonic batteries in my keyboard, or whether it's my Toyota pickup outside or my Toto toilet or, or whatever, Japanese engineering and technology is everywhere. Uh, this 170 years of a relationship between America and Japan has been so dynamic and fascinating. And, and so anyways, I look at the amazing technology and inventions that this combination of America and Japan brought the world without their contributions, which of course led to two of the largest economies in the world. Everyone in the world would be much poorer and living with nowhere near the convenience that we do today, 170 years. And I look back at that history and I see that out of that whole 170 years, there's just one dark cloud, a period of four years where these two cultures, these two nations turned their guns on each other and fought. And that is of course, what we call World War II. And uh, millions and millions of words have been written about that four-year period of what led up to it and what happened during that period. And that is, of course, something I'm not going to cover. But what I'm going to talk about here is the fact that the nation of America needed armies. And so they went to the mothers here in America and asked the mothers to give them their sons. And they went to the wives in America and they said, give us your husbands. We need these armies. And of course, the government of Japan did the same thing. They asked the mothers of Japan to give them their sons and the wives to give them their husbands. And these two men, these two groups of men went to war and fought. And what I'm now going to concentrate on is not the war and the fighting, but what happened the day after. Because, of course, both armies had to return their, their men back home after the fighting was over. And the men did return back home. But then they had the issue of the men who did not survive this war. And it was the obligation and duty of both governments to bring back the deceased respectfully back to the mothers and back to the wives. Both America and Japan had to deal with this as does every nation. And so we're gonna explore and see how each nation solved this problem. First of all, we're gonna look at the Americans here. The US Army or the American government created the, the US Army Graves Registration Act. And what this was, was a formal procedure for returning the remains of the deceased soldiers. Congress appropriated $190 million, which is approximately $3 billion in today's dollars, and they assigned 13,000 men to go out and recover the remains of deceased American soldiers from North Africa and Sicily to Belgium, from New Guinea to Okinawa. They combed the earth because back then when the American soldiers were killed in battle, they were, their bodies were collected and they were hastily buried in battlefield cemeteries. And these were where the remains stayed. Then under this Graves Registration Act, these teams of people went out to these cemeteries, identified who was buried where. They exhumed those remains. They had a casket. They had an escort assigned to each casket. They had paperwork. The escorts returned those respectfully back to the towns, back to the mothers, back to the wives in a ceremony showing great respect to the lost soldier. And that is when you go to a military cemetery today, that is who you see buried there. And that is how they arrived at that place. That is the American solution. The Japanese story is different. After the Japanese surrendered on September 2nd, 1945, 
Seven days later, most of these men were arrested. And America makes a big point out of 24, 28 or something high level officials that were arrested. But that's only part of the story because America also oversaw the arrest of about 5,700 other Japanese. And this included military people, politicians, industrial people, people who, who owned factories and manufactured things, uh, journalists, politicians, uh, journalists and writers and authors, and, and professors and educators. And so in effect, from Japanese society, more than 5,700 people were removed, put behind bars. And these were the leaders. These were people who knew how to make a plan and organize it and direct people to accomplish something. Next, in the command came Douglas General MacArthur, GHQ, and he was a supreme commander over everything in Japan. Now, the $190,000 million appropriated by Congress was for the recovery of American soldiers. None of this was intended for enemy combatants, as they referred to the Germans or Japanese. And Douglas, General Douglas MacArthur, he did not appropriate any money for the recovery of Japanese remains. He had other priorities, and this was not one of them. And so what we see now is the young men, the sons of mothers, the, the husbands of, of wives, who were sent out to war to fight and who were killed, were left. There was nobody coming to recover their remains. Now, in some cases, they were hastily buried with sand or, or a pit was, was created where their bodies were de deposited and buried. But in many cases, the remains were just left to lie. And the baking sunshine and the rain and the winds over time just deteriorated the bones. And that is largely the situation we face today. Here is former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe in 2015 visiting Iwo Jima and seeing the bone recovery effort. And you look at this man and you look at his face as he looks at these remnants on the tray in front of him. You see sadness and, and I see hopelessness in his eyes. He's looking at these clumps of decaying bone and he's just what, what, what can be done with this? Years and years of exposed bones and, and un, unprotected remains have just deteriorated to something that looks like tree bark or, or almost like fragments of wood. And that is, unfortunately, the, the fate of many people. Um, and so we're going to now look at the numbers because the missing in action from World War II today, right now, is from the American side, 39,658. And the DPAA, the Department of Defense, assures us that about 80% of these were planes that crashed in the water or ships that sunk, meaning there will be no recovery of these American soldiers. The Japanese story is 1,120,000 missing. And so we can now gauge this. We know that at least 40,000 of those American, of those Japanese were planes that crashed or ships that sunk. Or we can even go ahead and give, a, give the Americans the benefit of the doubt. Let's say the Americans shot down twice as many airplanes as the Japanese did, and they sunk twice as many ships. Let's say there's 80,000 Japanese remains who are on the bottom of the ocean. The others, the other 1 million, are a result of this inability of the Japanese to go out and recover the remains of their deceased soldiers, such as the Americans could, and the oversight by the Americans or, or lack of vision to send people out or provide a ship to do this. And so that is our situation today, and it's a very sad situation. And so that is basically where we are. The, as you saw from Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, there's just nothing but fragments in the sand. However, there is one hope and one opportunity 
to resolve this sad situation for that 1,120,000 people. And it's something that is so unique and specific to the Japanese that I'm going to have to explain it here to you. Because what we have here in Japan, as you see this young man and his wife holding their baby next to them, you see in his hand, he has something. See that triangular thing there? It's kind of hard to see. But if you look at the whole family picture here, you see it's this white vertical thing. And what that is, is actually a flag. And everybody standing behind this young man has written their name on that flag. Here's another man, another picture, and you see he's holding one of these unique flags. This is what it is. No other nation, no other culture in the world that I've ever been able to find, and I've looked for 12 years, ever did anything like this. It doesn't come from the government. It doesn't come from the military. It wasn't directed by somebody. It is something that was uniquely Japanese, organically designed. And so I have thought about this, trying to imagine what was the first one, because it, 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 it came from somewhere. And so in my own imagination, I think the first one came from a mother. And this mother was sending her son off to war. He'd been drafted. It's maybe 1936 or 1937. And she's making rice balls for him. So he'll have lunch to take with him, some onigiri. And maybe she takes a sewing needle and puts a thread through it and wraps it around a paper that he can take in case he loses a button. She's trying to think of things to send with her son to keep him comfortable so he can come home. And this woman has this flag. And in this moment of brilliance, she picks up a brush and she writes his name on the flag. And then she dips her hands in the black ink and she touches the fabric. Boom. And her husband walks by and he sees what his clever wife is doing. And he picks up a brush and he writes his name on it. And the other children in the house come by and they write their names and they fold this up and he carries it with him. And other soldiers in his company see this flag and they look at it and they think, what a wonderful thing to have from home. All of his family has signed this. So they tell their mothers, I want a flag with your name on it. And they send it. And this spreads from one person to two to 20 to 200. And pretty soon, everyone in Japan who is leaving home, going to war, brings with him one of these unique flags, one of these Yosagaki Hinomaru, as we call it, with everybody who knows that person, all of the relatives, neighbors, everybody signing it. It becomes this, in Japanese, I think the word is buma or a uh, fad or a fashion, and everyone has one. Everyone goes to war from home with these unique flags. Well, they are spectacular. They are unique. There's nothing else like them. And of course, on the battlefields, the allied soldiers, the Americans and British and Australians, realize that every Japanese soldier has one of these somewhere in his pocket, somewhere under his clothing, and they take them. Every battlefield, every body is searched. Everybody is looking for these flags because this is the most desired souvenir of the war. The thing to bring home and show your mother and father, look at, I have an enemy flag. They bring them home not by the hundreds. They bring them by the thousands, by the tens of thousands. And each one comes back proudly as a souvenir and trophy of success on the battlefield. Here is what now unfolds, you see, because each one of those flags was created by one family, one group of people, all aimed at one specific individual. What we now know is every one of those flags is different. Every one is unique. Every brushstroke, every time that ink touched that fabric, they were changing it from every other. 
And because of that, each flag is as unique as a fingerprint. We can look at that kanji characters, the writing, every time the ink touched the fabric, and it changes it in such a way and makes it so specific that it is as close to a, 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 a as unique as can be. In fact, it is so unique, it is almost like DNA. Just as a forensic anthropologist can take a drop of blood or a piece of hair and analyze it and open up the DNA and look at that change of, 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 of the chromosomes in the DNA, we can look at the kanji characters on these flags and trace them back with 100% certainty to the family. This man standing there holding a portrait of his father, that flag was his father's, and that is the only remains of his father that ever came home. That flag is that man's brother, the man on the right, that's his brother. This woman, we know this woman, that is her eldest brother. That is the only remain that came back to her from him. He was lost in the war. That family, multi-generational family, that flag is brother, uncle, great uncle, grandfather. It is, it is a variety of relations to that multi-generational family. This man here holding the portrait of his father, that is the only remains that came back to that man, that family. And you can see from the group of people who have assembled with him to greet the remains of his father, this is not something the Japanese take lightly. This is the equivalent in a, like America to having bone remain coming back. It is just as significant to the Japanese because that's all they have. And because of that, and I've witnessed this for years and years, I've tried to figure out how do we describe these flags? Because it isn't a human remain, but it is a remain. It is all that remains of that person. And, and, and so what do we call it? And the phrase that Obon Society has now coined to describe these unique flags is a non-biological human remain. It is not biological, it's not tooth or bone, but it is a human remain because that's all there is. Now, in addition to what this means to the Japanese family, we have to look at what it means to the Americans and British and Australians that have these because you cannot imagine the emotion that is pent up in these people. These are the sons and grandsons of the veterans who went to war and fought. They have these, and their feelings are, these should go back to the Japanese. Sincerely, they want to provide the Japanese with comfort and closure, and they want to repair the feelings from this war. They want to be friends. They want this to go back. We get contacted constantly by Americans who sincerely feel, this is their mission. This must go back. And in fact, I would say approximately once a week, if not twice a week, we have people contacting us who tell us, I want to personally go to Japan and return this to them personally. My father took this. I want to give it back. It is important for me to accomplish this. And so Obon Society finds itself now in this dynamic cross-cultural place where we have these veteran families in America who want to travel to Japan and meet the veteran family there and restore to them the only trace of their missing ancestor. And, and it's just this, the potential of this is so enormous in cross-cultural connections and, 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 and in, in the healing and show a friendship and trust. It, it just, it just uh, takes our breath away as we examine this. Now, I want to get into one specific case here in conclusion to show you and zoom in on one particular story. Because last April, we were contacted by a man in Hiroshima who wrote us and said, this is a picture of a flag that belonged to my grandfather. And it is on display in a museum in America. And it is very meaningful to my family to have this returned to us. 
Could Obo and society please help us obtain this and return it to us? And I started to investigate this because this was a very unusual, unusual request. And as it turns out, it gets more unusual because the museum happened to be a World War II aircraft carrier that was tied up in Corpus Christi, Texas. And his grandfather's flag, or what he said was his grandfather's flag, was on display there and had been there for almost 30 years. And there's a sign here along the side of it that tells us it was what they call a meatball flag, which is a derogatory term the Americans used back in World War II. And it says here that it's signed by these kamikaze pilots, which we knew, of course, wasn't true. But we asked the man, how do you know or what makes you think this was your grandfather's flag? Tell us. And he replied, I have photographic proof. I have a picture of my family. That's my grandfather. That's my grandmother holding my uncle. And that's my father there with the little round hat. And you look at my grandfather and you see what he has in his hand right there. And you look at the kanji characters on that. And then you look at the flag that's on the ship and you look at the kanji characters there. They match. They match perfectly. And the reason they match is because it is the same flag. Well, that was very convincing, but I told them, well, we're, this is like a, a museum on a ship and it's a proud part of their collection. Do you have any other proof? Because we're gonna have to talk to them and this is gonna be a very serious conversation. I asked him, so when you show a picture of this flag to your father, uh, is your father still alive? He says, oh, yes, my father's still alive. He's 82 years old. He, he used to run marathons up to a couple of years ago. Now he only does 10K races. And so he's very healthy and alert. I said, well, when you show him a picture, what does your father say? And he says, well, when my father looks at the picture of this flag, he says, that's my father's name there. And that's my grandfather's signature there. And these are all relatives here. And these are neighbors that still live next door to us. And in addition to that, this man told us, these three children in this photograph are, well, that's my father and my aunt and uncle, and they're still alive and very healthy, and they they're, they're live right next door to us here. So we were now convinced of his accuracy, and we were convinced that this was the family's flag. And so I had to create a presentation, a description, communicate with the administration of this museum ship, explain the circumstances of what was occurring here, and then ask them to make a decision. And the Americans investigated us, investigated everything we said, and they replied, absolutely, this belongs to the family. This must go back to them. And so they created this fabulous ceremony where they were going to remove it from the ship. We went down to Corpus Christi, Texas. Steve Banta, the executive director, you can go to their website and see a video of this. It's just amazing, their ceremony of what they did. And they removed this from their collection. Now you understand, 9 million visitors had seen this flag on display. 29 years it had hung on the wall. And he removed it, unpacked it, and gave it to Obon Society to take to Japan. And not only that, but he was so serious about this that he bought a ticket and he flew to Japan to be there so that we together could meet the three children of this missing soldier and return the remains of their missing father to them. What really struck me from this is this man here, the youngest son, that's him as a baby in his mother's arms. And whether he's weeks old there or months old, I don't know. He's a tiny infant. But he told us that he, the story of his father, of course, he has no memory of it, was almost like mythology. It was just a, a story his mother would say that about the man, and, and he really didn't exist in his mind until that flag was found. And when that flag was discovered that his father carried and it came back to him, that was the first time in his life that he felt the presence of his father. And so 
that is the work of Obon society. And, and now in conclusion, I will just say, as I pointed out at the first, we study history and we see the decisions that our fathers and grandfathers made. And as much as I would like to go back to 1946 and talk to Douglas MacArthur and tell him the importance of returning the remains of the deceased Japanese and sending parties of people out to recover these remains for the mothers and for the wives, I can't do that. I can't go back in time and change that. But just like we see here in these rivers in the Pacific Northwest that were dammed up by our grandfathers, we can do things to correct these oversights of the past. We can return these flags back to these families. Obon Society estimates there are 50,000 Yosagaki Hinamaru here in America right now, sitting in people's drawers and boxes and attics. And those could be traced back to families and provide them with closure and demonstrate the friendship and trust and relationship between America and Japan. So I'll conclude now. I understand there'll be questions and answers later on. So thank you very much, Dr. Akimoto. Well, Rex, uh, thank you very much for a, a wonderful, important uh, uh, presentation. I really appreciate the work that uh, uh, you've been doing with your associate and uh, uh, I am delighted to have uh, uh, this event with you today. And also, thank you very much for inviting me to the uh, ceremony at the USS Lexington Museum. I've been in this country for a long time, but it's uh, uh, one of the most uh, uh, moving and also uh, uh, meaningful experiences that I have in this country. So uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, friendship, reconciliation, goodwill of uh, people between the two countries. So thank you very much. I'd like to now invite uh, Honorable Haruko Arimura. Uh, Honorable Arimura is also uh, uh, a person uh, who is uh, uh, um, deeply uh, connected to the United States. She studied in the United States and uh, uh, she worked for uh, uh, American icon uh, McDonald's uh, uh, in Japan and uh, uh, He's, she's been uh, working hard to uh, uh, make the bridge between the two countries strong. And as I said at the opening, she's been taking this issue seriously herself. And uh, uh, it's an honor to have uh, uh, Honorable Arimura with us today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Akimoto. And uh, good morning, everyone, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, and my colleague. Wow, what a powerful, breathtaking presentation. I'm so proud to be part of this um, conversation online meeting uh, held by uh, Sasagawa Zaidan. Uh, most of all, I'd like to show my sincere appreciation to Sasagawa Heiwa Zaidan USA uh, for holding this wonderful opportunities. And uh, especially I'd like to show express uh, express um, my sincere gratitude to uh, Dr. Akimoto, uh, who is destined uh, to uh, make this US-Japan relationship um, strong bondage and uh, leading us to hold this presentation chance. Uh, my name is Haruko Arimura. I'm a Japanese diet member, and this is uh, my 23rd year of being serviced at the Japanese diet. And I used to be the Minister of State for first gender equality and women's empowerment during um, Abe cabinet, Prime Minister Abe cabinet, who uh, is a top leader who have the most understanding for this Yosegaki Hinomaru. And since we lost Prime Minister Abe's uh, contribution last year, I feel that we have to inherit his uh, will uh, to make a strong bondage of US and Japan relationship for our peace and stability and prosperity. And one of the very important part is this Yosegaki um, that uh, Mr. Uh, Keiko and uh, Lex um, Zeke uh, made a tremendous effort for this uh, two countries and uh, universal bondage. 
uh, I have been involved with this uh, activities for seven years. Seven years ago, I raised this issue to the Japanese diet uh, because at that time, uh, let me introduce the paper. At that time, both the US and Japan uh, auction company, unfortunately, uh, makes this uh, Yosegaki Hinomaru for the uh, internet auction saying this is 500 bucks or 1,000 yen and raising the um, price for the internet auction. And uh, for the remaining of the war, uh, they said, oh, we, we hurt to see this, uh, our remainings uh, holding the picture, uh, the, the price of this. And I raised this issue to the Japanese diet, who, which has been nationally broadcasted. And I asked Prime Minister Abe then, how does he feel by seeing this? And also I asked uh, Minister of Health and Labor, as well as Minister of Economic and Trade and Minister of Foreign Affairs. All ministers, which include Prime Minister Abe, they feel so sorry seeing this and um, they realize these flags should be uh, treated with strong respect and dignity. And they make best effort to that. And by broadcasting this nationwide um, Japanese diet discussion, uh, eBay, American, one of the most famous um, uh, internet auction company, uh, has been discouraged uh, to sell internet. And they avoid, instead, they encourage us to uh, connect to the uh, returning this uh, Hinomaru Yosegaki and Senin body uh, to Japanese families. And uh, I have witnessed returning uh, flags to the remaining families. I understand that uh, most of the family who had dedicated their loved one to the war, to the military, end up, ended up having no clue when his loved one passed away, how he passed away, and ended up, ended up having no remaining bones. And sometimes, many cases, Yosegaki Hinomaru is the only one article that the, that shows he has lived to the family. And I have heard that, oh, my father or my uh, brother finally came back with a form of fla flag, but I'm convinced that this flag is a true soul of my siblings. He came back in spite of all the countless effort and with miles of miles, with great support with American or England or Canadian support, goodwill. And he came back all the way to Japan, all the way to my hometown, all the way to my home. And tonight, I'd like to hold this flag um, to cover all the years he had missed and with, with reporting my parents saying my brother finally came back with a flag. Um, as you know, US the only alliance we have, and that is a key for prosperity and peace. And uh, I'm really, um, honored that Prime Minister passed away, um, Abe. Uh, this is a picture that uh, Prime Minister Abe had a strong, deep uh, hug uh, with the survivor of Pearl Harbor. And he is committed that US-Japan relationship and trustworthy uh, friendship is very important. And this is a key foundation. And um, Yosegaki Hinoma's returning um, soul bondage uh, demonstrate that uh, we can reconcile with a sincere friendship and with a pride that we serve for the uh, country. And everyone has the feeling that um, nobody wants to lose their loved one, but uh, in spite of that, people fight for the cause. And after that, people can reconcile with a strong tie. And uh, I really appreciate Obon Society, especially uh, Lex 
uh, Keiko and Lex's uh, contribution. But uh, finally, I have to be candid. Although their um, contribution of this bondage is very precious, their resource is very limited. And um, I'd like to know how we can support this bondage effort. And two years from now, we will have 80th anniversary after the end of the war. And uh, by that then, um, I'd like to see how we can make this effort more uh, sustainable with a lot of people's awareness. Uh, thank you for, again, conducting this uh, morning, this tonight uh, meeting. This is uh, 10.45 in Japan, Tokyo time, uh, but I really appreciate uh, Sasagawa Zaidan and uh, uh, Obon Society's contribution. Thank you very much. Well, Arimuru-sensei, thank you very much for your uh, kind uh, uh, words uh, for us and also uh, our deep uh, uh, interest uh, in this issue. And uh, um, I'm sure that there are a lot of people who are uh, counting on you. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, now I'd like to uh, uh, invite Professor Mutsuda, Hidemi Mutsuda of Hiroshima University, representing the Mutsuda family. Thank you for my introduction, uh, Dr. Akimoto. I'm honored to be here in this opportunity. My name is Hidemi Mutsuda. I'm grandson of Shigeyoshi Mutsuda. So I'd like to express my sincere gratitude to Mr. Akimoto of the uh, Sasagawa Peace Foundation of USA and all those concerned for giving me this precious opportunity. Thank you so much. So today I'd like to, um, I'd like to talk about my feeling as one of the valued, valued family member after the return of my grandfather's Yosegaki Hinomaru. So the first one is our family gathered at Yaskuni's shrine to receive the remain of my missing grandfather. Finally, after 18 years, our entire family, entire family was together again. I saw the really joying in my father. It means that this was a day we will never forget. It changed all our lives. Second one is the return of the Yosegaki Hinomaru flag is the only remains of my grandfather that ever came home in Japan. To us, it was the same as if it had been his born remains. There is no difference. The Yosegaki Hinomaru flag truly is a, is a non-biological human remains. The third one is the return of the uh, of the, these flag is a powerful demonstration of the peace, friendship, and reconciliation between our countries, America and Japan. It makes everyone very happy to see thoughtful Americans helping to bring back our missing family members. And last one is there are a million of people in Japan, just like my family, they lost their father in this war and no remains ever returned. They have spent many years in sadness. I wish someone would help Obon society accelerate their program so more Yosegaki Hinomaru flags could return to more families. So this photo shows reunion for the first time in almost 80 years. My grandmother's funeral was postponed when my grandfather's Yosegaki Hinomaru was found at USS Lexington Museum. Then it would be returned from America to Japan because my father wanted my grand sorry uh, my father wanted my grandfather and my grandmother to meet directly again in this world. As you can see at the right bottom hand side, 
my grandfather's yosegaki hinomaru and my grandfather's ash could reunion before going to the heaven at the private unofficial place with peoples involved in US Rex USS Lexington, Obon society staff, and Shigeyoshi's family after the return ceremony in Tokyo. Okay, next please. Uh, this private photo was taken at this heartful and precious time among them. So this photo shows means a true reconciliation and friendship between our countries, Japan and America. So as you can see, USS Lexington staff, including the exec executive director, Mr. Steve Bander, or at the right-hand side, and Obon Society, including Mr. Rex and Miss Keiko at the bottom side, our family, including my grandfather's Yosegaki Hinomaru and grandmother's Ash, and and the Buddhist Buddhist uh, mortuary a tablet at the center of the photo. Actually, this is a just only second time of Shigeyoshi Mutsuda's family photo since my grandfather went to the war. Okay, next, please. Okay, this is a final photo. Oh, this photo shows my grandfather and my uncle with my grandfather's Yosegaki Hinomaru in front of the uh, Shigeyoshi Mutsuda's home. That is the same place where my grandfather was exactly standing before going to the wall eight years ago. So as you can see, my father has a very, very nice smile at the right-hand side. It's like a being a small, ch small child again holding my grandfather's Yosegaki Hinomaru, surrounded by his entire family. Actually, I have never seen this kind of the, my father's very nice smile before. Also, I will never forget how Shigeyoshi Mutsuda's three children, who are already over 80 years old, were having fun talking about old stories with their grandparents, reminiscing about the past. After that, my father told me that he was so glad that I had lived a long time. I strongly feel that the Yosegaki Hinomaru flag truly is the non-biological human remains for all of the Japanese people. No matter how many years have passed, my grandfather continues to live in our family's heart, even though in the next generation forever. So finally, I want to inform you that my father become, no, no, my father became so active, so active, more and more, because he got a lot of lecture related to Yosegaki Hinomaru return and peace and war to not only elder people, but also the small children in the elementary school. It means that delay button, delay button of the peace forever in the next generation to generation in the world. That's all. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much. Professor Mutsuda, thank you very much for your uh, story, uh, telling us, sharing us about the family story. I really appreciate it. And also, uh, uh, just like you said, uh, smiles of uh, 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 your father and uncle uh, show sense of closure that uh, they have by receiving Yosegaki Hinomaru of, uh, of their father. So thank you very much. Now, I'd like to open up the floor for uh, uh, Q&A. Uh, if I may, uh, I'd like to ask Rex about the uh, uh, reaction of uh, uh, you know, leadership and also people involved at the uh, USS Lexington. Uh, after all, the flag has been on display for uh, almost 30 years, and uh, uh, it is uh, uh, deeply connected to uh, the history of the museum and also USS Lexington. 
I saw the uh, um, signs uh, uh, from Tarawa to Tokyo uh, all over the ship. But uh, uh, what's the reaction uh, from the uh, museum when you first uh, contacted them? The um, Thank you very much for the question. Uh, of course, there was, I think, shock when I first sent the, the letter to them explaining, and it was a very simple letter and very brief, but just like anybody running anything, owning anything, if somebody notifies them that there's one particular item that is different from what they think, there's that shock and disbelief. But fortunately, I had the background proof. I, we Obon Society has the really an impeccable a reputation. And so as they searched our background and they searched the information, they realized that what I was saying was accurate and true. Then I believe there was internal discussion that, of course, I didn't hear. But very quickly, the response that came back from them was, this belongs to the family. There was no argument, no dispute. They recognized that this was a personal item. And it, it should go back. How to make that happen, when that was going to happen was then the next question. But the response from the ship, from the administration, executive director Steve Banta and his crew was very positive. Um, they, they, they realized, as many museums do, some of their exhibits can get out of time. And we see that throughout America, exhibits of World War II were established years and years ago by people who maybe were veterans of the war. And it has a narrative, as we saw with the sign meatball flag, that is right out of World War II vocabulary. That's not something people use today. And these exhibits get established and they sit there and they sit there year after year. And what the USS Lexington is now doing is they are updating that exhibit. It is no longer that flag that's in Japan, but they're going to tell the story of where it actually came from and where it went back to. And so now this is part of their updated exhibit, the return of this personal family item to the family. So uh, it's going to transform their exhibit. Well, thank you very much. I, I understand that it was a first trip to Japan by uh, Mr. Banta, correct? Yes, that's correct. Yes. And I understand that after the ceremony, uh, he spent a week or so in Japan. And well, what's her, I mean, what is his impression about Japan visiting for the first time, uh, uh, you know, uh, the trip uh, uh, realized by a returning of this flag? I, I have not spoken directly with him. I was with him there during it. And I think as most Americans feel who go to Japan for the first time, they are just astonished at the hospitality, the, the kindness, the politeness, the cleanliness uh, coming from America, the, 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 the lack of danger out at night in the streets going to get something to eat. Uh, I, I believe they were smitten by the Japanese people, as often happens to visitors who go there. Um, I, I, I think he wants to go back as soon as he can. His wife was with him and she enjoyed every, she, she would be up at five in the morning out on the streets and, and stay out till late at night. Uh, they, 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 they are very big, uh, affectionate fans of Japanese society and culture today. Thank you very much. I'd like to take up a question from, uh, anonymous, uh, uh participant. Uh, this person's interested in uh, uh, sending body. Uh, what is the sending body, and what are the differences uh, 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 with uh, Yosegaki Hinomaru? Okay, um, sending body that really translates into one thousand stitches. The Japanese had two traditions during World War II that we have received because Obon Society receives a wide array of, of personal items from family wedding photographs to diaries to a, a, a wide array of, of personal items. And we received these senabari. And what this was is, if you can imagine this, uh, a long piece of fabric, maybe six feet long, that's maybe six or eight inches wide, and the Japanese women 
before their son or husband would go to war, would take a red thread and they would pass it through the fabric and tie a knot in that thread. They call it a French knot. It's like a, a little loopy knot and then put the needle back through the, the fabric. So above the fabric sits one red knot. And then that mother or wife would go out on the streets and her objective was to confront 1,000 other women, strangers, neighbors, whoever, and ask them to take that needle and make another knot, one after another after another, under the belief that if she had this piece of fabric with 1,000 knots tied by 1,000 women, and if her husband or, or, or son wore that around his middle, it would magically stop the bullets that were shot at him and save his life. Uh, for the Americans listening to this, it is hard to imagine this effort that would have taken, but this was a tradition. The women did this. The men wore them around them, thousand knots by a thousand women. And these also were a very popular souvenir. As I look at battlefield photographs from World War II, most of the deceased Japanese on the ground, their pants are untied and their shirts are pulled up. And I didn't understand this. I thought just the, the, the explosion and the blast and the concussion is what undid their clothing. But later I realized that every one of them had their clothing undone to take these cenobaris, very popular souvenirs also. We received them upon occasion. However, they were such a personal item, there is rarely any writing on them. There's rarely names. This is the mother or the wife giving her son or husband uh, almost like a life jacket, a preserver, a bulletproof vest. And so it's not like the Yosagaki Hinomaru. We have returned a couple of them that had names on them, but most of them are just a piece of fabric with a thousand knots in them. And so they're very difficult and complex to return back to the family. Thank you very much. The next question comes from Anton Kudyashov. How do individuals in the United States and all over the world know to reach out to Obon Society if they have a flag in their possession? I, um, I'll try to answer that question. I assume people know about Obon Society just from our 13 years of operations. We are on the internet. Stories have been written about us, little TV programs. We do not have a program of marketing or advertising. There is no outreach on our behalf. We just receive emails or phone calls from unknown people and how they find us. We uh, rarely know. We rarely ask them because we're just dealing with their issues. But it's just, um, I guess, through the mass media, they have these items. Maybe their father dies. They're cleaning out the house. They find this item in a box. It happens every day. And they look at it, this Japanese flag, and they get on the internet and start Googling. And pretty soon, they find Obon Society. And if that's their intention, they contact us. So it is purely organic. We do not market or advertise. Thank you very much. Um, next uh, uh, questions from uh, uh, Mr. Jeffrey Johnson. He understands that uh, he knows uh, veterans uh, uh, who have so closure and forgiveness with the Japanese in their final years uh, uh, because of their experiences during the World War II. But uh, uh, he thinks that uh, younger Americans uh, uh, don't have that uh, uh, appreciation uh, you know, growing up with the Hollywood movies about the Pacific War and never personally uh, experienced war. His question is, uh, um, do you have any advice on how to change uh, the hearts of the uh, younger generations? And uh, uh, does the Obon Society purchase Yosegaki Hinomaru from the internet as well? He is a uh, president of Atlanta World War II History uh, Roundtable. First of all, Obon Society never purchases anything. In fact, we get contacted, I'd say several times a month with people notifying us that uh, there's an auction and here's this item and we should bid on it and buy it. Uh, we 
do not ever purchase any items. That's not our, our policy. And as far as like eBay auctions, that has come to an end now. Uh, eBay works with us very closely. Every week we're in contact with them. Anybody who tries to sell something on eBay related to a personal item of Japan is blocked. And this is an internal eBay policy now. They recognize these items, the Yosagaki Hinomuru, as a spiritual cultural item, just as they would any religious object from an Indian tribe or a African a group of people. They recognize these, again, as a spiritual cultural artifact of Japan, and eBay refuses to sell these on their site, and they remove them. If people try a second time, they block that seller and, and do not allow him to participate on eBay. They are very serious about keeping these off of their site. As far as impacting young people and educating young people about this, um, I, I have really no advice for that other than just a demonstration of the return of Yosagaki Hinomaru to Japan. Um, the more this is done, People witness this, they see it, they realize this is a cross-cultural connection and repairing the damages or the effects of war. And um, I believe that is probably the best way to reach out and educate people, especially young people, is just through demonstration. I have set a personal goal. I don't know that I'll achieve it. I know it's possible to achieve but my goal is to scale up Obon Society operations to where we are returning one flag each day to Japan. That would be 365 a year. I know the flags are there. I know the system is there. I know the families are waiting for these. I think if we achieve that level of 365 returns a year, one a day to Japan, that will become such a strong message to the young people, not only in America and in Japan, but around the world of this outreach and this connection, that that will be the strongest educational message ever sent out. All right, thank you very much. Next question comes from Randall Lanning. Could you please describe the process used to try to find the family of the lost Japanese soldier? Um, thank you very much for that question uh no i i can't describe that process uh really any more than um if you were to ask the fbi how do you find somebody uh who's who you're looking for it is it is complicated it is specific case by case depending on how much information is written on the flag uh, Japan has very strict privacy laws that we have to follow. Uh, there's no phone books in Japan. There's there's a, a, a very complicated network there. So I really can't get into the details of how we how we do this because each item is different and specific, and 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 that's just how I'll just have to summarize it. But. Uh, we follow all laws in Japan about this. We work with different groups in Japan that assist us. We have our core team of experienced experts who handle different aspects of this. And, um, and uh, we take each one, one at a time, individually. This can't be done in some kind of a group thing like Amazon ships out packages. It's, each one has to be handled and examined and analyzed individually. And so... It's a very complicated process. Thank you very much. Next question comes from Sho Watanabe of Nippon Television. He's interested in uh, learning uh, challenges of uh, collecting Japanese soldiers, known uh, biological human remains from the people in the United States. He understands that uh, there are some flags that are in the public places, such as uh, uh, Honorable Arimura mentioned on the uh, marketplace and so on and so forth. But he said, on the other hand, there are still many artifacts of Japanese soldiers that remain undisclosed in the storage of many American homes. So how the Obun Society is approaching to the American society and the veterans community to identify those non-biological human remains and promote uh, action of uh, uh, returning those artifacts to Japan? 
well, if I understand his question correctly, uh, um, uh, we do not reach out to anybody. We don't. We do not communicate with anybody asking them to send these items. Uh, they they come to us organically. Uh, if I if I went to my computer right now and turned it on, I would expect to see somewhere between four and six emails from people I've never met before. I've never seen their names, and they are saying a story. And it will be my mother died. We were cleaning out her house, and here is this box in my father's closet. It has these things in it. Is this? a Japanese Yosagaki and they'll send us a photograph. The next one will be something else. Somebody will say, my father, my grandfather has had this. I knew about it since I was a boy. I inherited from my grandmother. I want it to go back to Japan. And, and it's just all of these different circumstances that come at us. If you were in our office looking at our emails, you would see just a myriad of different communications and contacts reaching out to us from Australia, England, the United States, Canada, other places, people discovering these and wanting these returned. Um, I, I don't think I answered your question completely, but uh, um, that, that's the, the, the best I can say about, about how this is happening. Thank you. Two uh, uh, questions from uh, two anonymous attendees. One is, uh, are there any returning ceremonies that Obon Society is currently planning that they could not tell us about. And also uh, 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 another question, what happened to the flag received by the Obon Society that are unattributable to a family community? Very, very good questions. About an upcoming returning ceremony, there is always one somewhere in the works. And uh, and quite frankly, uh, uh, I would have to check with our staff that is is dealing with that. I'm 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 uh, that's not in my attention right now. But uh, I imagine uh, our associate up in Hokkaido, he is very uh, he's very keen on this and he probably has something coming up in the near future. Um, I'd have to look in to see about the next returning ceremony. And that was the first question. The second question was about what when you oh, the find items, family? the items when we can't find a family. And again, uh, this happens. We keep those. Everything we receive is kept archivally in storage. We continue to search. There's no end to the search. We, we sometimes find families that we've been searching since 2017 or 2018. If the soldier had sisters and the sisters have married other people, the last name change, it's a very complicated searches. And every so often, after five or six years, we make that connection and we're able to contact that family. But everything is kept by us. Everything we receive, everything will go back to Japan, to Japanese soil, and eventually be sorted out. We have two things going on, and one is there is constantly improved technology such as AI, and then there's constant more awareness in Japan of this, this program. And so we have the possibility of people in Japan contacting us with information that we could match with a flag to help them find their grandfather or their father, or maybe in the future as there's more development in, in, in AI, we can do a better job of finding the families, but we do our very best and everything is kept and everything will be returned to Japanese soil. Thank you very much. I'm gonna ask one last question before I invite you, uh, Honorable Arimura, uh, to have a final word. A question uh, uh, comes from uh, Jared Chopra and others, essentially uh, uh, um, asking about the situation in Australia and uh, Great Britain. In the United States, there's uh, this goodwill and uh, uh, thanks to uh, action by you and others, uh, flags are returning to Japan. But what about uh, uh, flags in uh, uh, Australia and uh, uh, Great Britain? We've received and returned uh, numerous items from both countries. Um, there is still uh, an awareness that is growing. And I think this is a leadership position of the United States. Uh, uh, they, have, they have the items. We know they have them. They have their feelings about the war and the preservation of items from the war. However, this is what's so important about America in so many different areas and different fields. America 
leads the way. America shows other people how to how to be respectful, how to heal, how to uh, whatever. And so I am sure as more and more items from America are returned, and I know it's happening, the British and the Australians are watching and they are following the same pattern. Because, you know, essentially, what we all have to remember this is we divide, we like to draw these lines and divide and say, well, that's Australian, that's Canadian, that's Japanese, that's Chinese. The truth of the matter is, we are all human beings. Everybody has a family. Everybody loves their family the same. Everybody feels the same grief when a family member is missing. And I think ultimately, once we break down those barriers of those people or us or them or us, and we realize in Japan are children of soldiers, our wives of soldiers who lost their family member, and they feel exactly the same love for that person as we feel for our family. And I think it just gets down to the core human instinct of not wanting to deprive a child of comfort of connecting with his father, like we saw with the Masuda family. These were innocent children of the war. This is their opportunity to connect. And I think the power of that human sense of decency will finally come to the surface. And the Australians and English will understand this benefits the Japanese families far more than it benefits me to keep this, and they'll return them. Thank you. I'd like to uh, uh, close the event with uh, uh, final words from uh, uh, Honorable Haruko Arimura and then Rex. If my understanding is correct, I didn't expect to be called final poll. <laughs> so this is my surprise, but thank you for letting me uh, to have a, a few words uh, before the closure. Uh, in Japan, Almost 90% of population were born after the war. Um, this is 78th year after the war. And uh, the accurate number in Shiga Prefecture, 88% of the population were born after the war. So it's difficult to imagine what happens. And it became just a history that we learned from the textbook rather than the real story. But uh, Yosegaki Hinomaru uh, can make this history live. And just like Sam mentioned, this is a, um, they realize, we realize they have arrived. And this is the proof that they have been loved. They had a family, they had a peers, and they had an encouragement to fight for something that they find value and they finally reconcile and we can unite. And uh, I'm happy to witness uh, in Japan, even the Mutsuda-san's case uh, that was held in the end of July, this July at the Yasukuni Shrine. And uh, I had a chance to meet uh, Lexington Military Museum's top Banta-san and Lex and Keiko-san, uh, as well as Mutsuda-san's three families uh, who didn't have father's uh, memory, but finally they had hugged. And I encourage everyone to uh, have a chance to witness how they are returned. And that's a very moving story. And again, uh, thank you for, um, I really appreciate that uh, giving us the chance for Sasagawa Zaidan to spread this real story. And I look forward to uh, exchange the idea how we can make um, this sustainable. Um, that's the closure and my appreciation to US Sasagawa Zaidan and uh, Keiko-san and Obo Society Lex-san as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Professor Mutsuda, would you like to say a quick uh, final word? No? Thank you so much. So uh, I think that uh, we have not enough time in this meeting. So I have, I want to say just one thing. So Yosegaki Hinomaru flag truly is a non-biological human remains, I think. So uh, I want to say someone would help or want society accelerate this 
these important programs.、Uh, so, more Yosegaki no more flag could return to more family as well. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.、Uh, not just Obon Society, but I think uh, uh, effort of uh, national effort、uh, on the other side of the Pacific is also very important. Rex, you have a final word. Thank you very much,、uh, Dr. Akimoto. I, I've probably said enough, but I would just、uh, like to conclude here by speaking to the Americans who are watching this,、uh, the influential Americans.、Um, I know a great deal of money and time and effort is spent on cross cultural connections and proving and showing and demonstrating our friendship between America and Japan. And I know the topic of war is a very delicate issue. And it's easier to change, exchange students and politicians and, and, and other people. But this is an area that has kind of been a blind spot. In American society, these personal items and this vast amount of families that have been interrupted by the loss of the return of their missing relatives. And America, we can do something about this. Us Americans can accelerate this program. The 80th anniversary of the end of the war is coming in a couple of years. And we could really not only impact the people of Japan, but the whole world. We can demonstrate how to heal. After war, how to put the pieces back. This could become a, a demonstration of international goodwill and peace. And so I hope the influential Americans watching this will take this very seriously. And if they have more questions, reach out to us or to Dr. Akimoto at the Sasakawa Peace Foundation, and we can answer more questions and have a further discussion about accelerating and expanding this program. Well, thank you very much. It's been a, a pleasure and honor to be、uh, all of you、uh, to talk about this、uh, important issue and look forward to、uh, seeing you again. So, thank you very much, particularly、uh, Arimura Sensei、uh, joining us uh, from Tokyo late at night. So, thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye.